Hi everyone, welcome to Queer Stories. Today I want to talk to you about my favorite BLTV series of all time, and that is The Untamed. We're coming up on the second anniversary of this TV series being aired, and I, like many others, fell absolutely in love with this show. And I didn't just fall in love with it because the story was great, and also because the actors did an amazing job portraying their characters, but I personally also fell in love with the show as a queer person. I think we're always striving to see queer representation that we feel like is good, and um, that can sometimes be hard to find. I also really have to admire the people who made this show because they were making a story that is basically a queer love story in a time and in a place where being queer is not really very well accepted. So I'm basically going to take you on a little journey of looking at the untamed through the lens of a queer person and why it's meaningful personally to me. So first I'd like to look at one of the main characters of the show, Wei Wuxian. Wei Wuxian, the way that I read his character, both in the novel and in the TV series, is bisexual. I know that there are some people that debate that. It's not necessarily super explicit in the way that it's represented, but to me it's pretty clear. We see that there are some moments in the show, for example, when Wei Wuxian is at the banquet, when he sort of like looks at these dancers and gives them a look up and down and a look of appreciation. And so we kind of get the sense that Wei Wuxian is attracted to females at that moment. And you also see this hilariously disapproving look on Long Wenji's face after Wei Wuxian checks out these girls, which I just thought was such a beautiful, clear, like little moment for me. Um, so I think bisexual representation in TV shows is really important, and uh, maybe I'm latching on to something here, but I really think that his character was portrayed as bisexual. In my mind, the way that Wei Wuxian is portrayed in this TV series is that he's probably mostly attracted to women until he first meets Lan Wenji. And you see that moment when Lan Wenji sort of walks in and he looks ethereal and gorgeous, and Wei Wuxian almost has this like, dumbstruck look on his face like he's like oh crap that is the most beautiful human being I've ever seen um, but I don't think he quite had a queer awakening there he definitely had an aesthetic appreciation uh, for Lan Wenji I mean who can blame him Lan Wenji is like the most beautiful person on the face of the earth um, but definitely he had he didn't quite go to a sexual place at that moment and we can see that because there are moments later on in their interactions together, like, for example, when they're in the cave scene and La Wanji is sort of like kind of expressing queer things and Wei Wuxian is just like not picking up what La Wanji is putting down, right? At that moment where La Wanji is like, are you an idiot? <laughs> when, when Wei Wuxian su suggests that La Wanji might like Mian Mian. So definitely, I think... You know, Wei Wuxian didn't quite get there in his mental uh, form factoring that he had a special feeling towards Lan Wenji actually until after he was reincarnated. Um, he definitely did see Lan Wenji as his soulmate, as his best friend, but I don't think it quite went to that other place until after the reincarnation. There are some people that will argue that the reason that that happened or one of the reasons that that might have happened that way is that when Wei Wuxian was reincarnated, that he was reincarnated into Mo Xuan Yu's body and that Mo Xuan Yu was queer and that that might have had some kind of like influence on him. But I really don't think that's what it was. I personally think, or at least I would like it to be, the fact that Wei Wuxian was on his own personal journey in far, as far as his sexuality goes, because I think a lot of people have this impression that queer people just like they pop out of the womb and boom, we're gay. We all know we're gay. Um, but especially depending on the environment around you, you might not have the language to talk about some of the feelings that you're feeling inside. You also might not fully equate um, infatuation with sexuality. You know, you can be infatuated with somebody mentally without thinking about touching them physically. And I do think that a lot of queer people, you know, we go on our own journey in life. And some people come out when they're 16 or whatever and or 12 or 8, and some people come out in their 30s and 40s. And so I think, like, you know, everyone's journey of queerness is a little bit different. 
And I do think that the way that Wei Wuxian's story was portrayed in the Untamed TV series showed him having this kind of journey, uh, which I thought was really nice because it just shows that there's a variety of different ways to be queer and that it's not always like, oh, you're gay and you popped out gay from the womb kind of thing, right? Like there's even people like me that I knew that I was bisexual in the sense that I knew that I was attracted to both females and males um, when I was really, really young. Probably my first attractions were to females when I was like, you know, 12 years old, definitely 12 years old. I remember the exact female in question, but I was also attracted to boys too. And so for me, I didn't quite know what that meant. I didn't have the language to speak about that, but I only actually came out as non-binary and genderqueer this year in my late 30s, right? And so for me, the the journey of gender was a lot more nuanced and it took a lot longer for me to get to this place where I understand myself now. Um, but the sexuality piece was a little bit easier for me. But for some people, that sexuality piece is also really confusing and, and it takes a while for people to kind of like figure out what they want and what they're interested in and, um, you know, what you want to do about that as well. Um, so. I definitely really appreciated Wei Wuxian's character arc and the way it was displayed because I think it shows that kind of reality. Apart from the sexuality piece, I also really enjoyed just some general things about Wei Wuxian's character arcs. I really loved the way that he was an orphan and that he was, um, you know, brought into this family and they had a bit of conflict, like it wasn't super easy. You know, it was simultaneously a relationship that was very close and very loving with the with the father, and yet there was some strife between the mother and a little bit of competition with the brother. And I think those sorts of family dynamics are pretty realistic. You know, like my relationship with various different members of my family is not just cookie cutter the same. And also relationships can develop over time and can change over time. So I really liked some of the family dynamics that we saw between Wei Wuxian and his family members. But I also think this idea of being an orphan itself is kind of, you know, I think almost most people who are queer kind of feel like that in our own families. I used to describe myself when I was younger as the black sheep of the family because um, you know, I, I came from a family where I have three older sisters and they were all sort of more uh, stereotypically presenting in their femininity and, um, you know, had pretty standard relationships with the guys. And I just always felt like the ugly duckling because I always knew that I was different. And to me, different equaled ugly. Um, I don't think that anymore. Don't worry. I don't have those <laughs> issues. Um, but I definitely did feel like an outsider. And so I think this idea of being the orphan is, is really a lot like being an outsider. And I am thinking about what might have been different if Wei Wuxian had been raised by his own parents. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of that story. That's not the story that was that was played out. I do think it would have, since they came across as a bit more liberal and sort of chaotic, just like Wei Wuxian, I think that, you know, that that could have been a much more nurturing environment for him um, and a much more accepting environment of him. Um, you know, but I also think that the family dynamic that was portrayed be between him and the Jiang clan was really, really great. The last thing I want to talk about as regards um, Wei Wuxian and his character arcs is that I really enjoyed this aspect of this demonic cultivation. And I actually think demonic cultivation itself is a metaphor um, or it could be interpreted as a metaphor. I don't know whether she intended it to be in interpreted that way, but it can be interpreted as a metaphor itself for queerness because, um, you know, demonic cultivation is basically seen as impure, as, um, you know, like morally subject, um, degenerate, and how many times have we heard queerness described in those same terms, right? Like people will say things like, it's okay to be queer as long as you don't act upon it. And I kind of feel like the same thing could be said of demonic cultivation. Like it's okay to know how to use demonic cultivation, but it's not okay to actually practice it because that's in a moral gray area that we don't want to go into. 
and it makes you dirty and unclean and, and all of that stuff. So it, in those ways, I kind of um, related just to that whole metaphor of demonic cultivation and that idea of him being ostracized from the entire community around him because of what they saw as his lifestyle choices, um, you know, was really impactful as an idea to capture. And I think a lot of queer people can feel that way um, about our own experiences on the earth, right? About being ostracized and cyber bullied online, <laughs> you know, like some of the stuff that, that people did to Wei Wuxian after the demonic cultivation stuff really started taking off and, and he protected the Wens and then he was demonized himself is something that I think, you know, if, if you're any kind of trans person on Twitter these days, you are getting cyber bullied, <laughs> myself included. Like it's just not, um, there, there's no universe where that doesn't happen right now. And so I think that's an experience that a lot of us can relate to. Um, and so I thought that whole arc of him being ostracized and then him basically committing suicide when he let himself be thrown off the mountain. Um, and then, uh, you know, that, that is, oof, like that is like the definition of what happens to young people today when they get cyber bullied and they get ostracized and they commit suicide. Oh, I'm going to get teary eyed just like continuing on that thought. But basically that to me was very heart wrenching and it was really personal. And, um, you know, I think that experience is something that anyone who's been cyber bullied can kind of relate to that experience. And then subsequently Wei Wuxian's attempts to kind of protect the Wens, you know, is, is, is like people that are trying to protect marginalized groups today. Um, so you're like, kind of like a freedom fighter and and these people are misunderstood and they're not committing any evil acts or doing anything wrong and you're ostracizing them anyway. You know, that's definitely something that, um, you know, within Wei Wuxian's character arc was just so powerful and so meaningful. So let's switch gears now and talk about Lan Wenji. The eternally gay Lan Wanji. Like, oh my god, I love this character. Um, you could not be more gay than Lan Wanji. But actually, I'm not, I'm not gonna call him just strictly gay. I have another term that I would like to apply to Lan Wanji, and that is demisexual. People have joked that Lan Wanji is Wei Wuxian sexual. In other words, like, you know, throughout the series, like he never displays any kind of attraction or interest in anybody else. It's just, this is the one person that is for him. And, um, you know, I think that fits perfectly with the idea of demisexuality. So if you haven't heard of the term demisexual before, what it means is that you only experience sexual attraction after you have an emotional connection first. So to me, I actually think that the term demisexual can be applied to Lao Wanji. In contrast to Wei Wuxian, who like looks at everything that moves and says, wow, you're attractive. You know, like Lao Wanji doesn't do that. He's very much like, you know, um, the, the person that I'm interested in is this one person and that's the only person. And it's, it's interesting when you look at the way that Lao Wanji falls in love with Wei Wuxian, you can even see there's like this, oh fuck moment when um, Lang Wanji is painting the lanterns and Wei Wuxian is basically talking about his ethos, right? The way that he lives his life and his code of ethics and how he wants to be somebody that helps other people. And you can see Lang Wanji's eyes as he just goes, oh my God. And he's like, this, this is a really, really interesting person. Um, and I think that was the moment that Lang Wanji fell in love with him. So it wasn't really about Wei Wuxian's physical appearance, even though, of course, Xiao Chan is like godly appearance. But it wasn't about his physical appearance. The thing that made Lan Wenji fall in love with him was his ideals. Um, and I think that is really, really beautiful. He really fell in love with his spirit. And this also um, kind of is born out through the reincarnation theme that we see in the story. So before... Uh, Wei Wuxian is reincarnated and after he is re reincarnated into Mo Xuan Yu's body, you know, in, in the case of the TV show, they're both played by Xiao Chan. But, you know, if you read the novel, the physical appearance of these two people is actually very different. 
Um, so in the case of the story in the TV show, it doesn't come across that way as impactfully. But um, we know that Lan Wenqi is not attracted to Wei Wuxian as a physical body, right? He's attracted to Wei Wuxian's spirit, his soul, and so it doesn't matter to him what body Wei Wuxian is in. He's in love with the soul. And I actually think that's a type of queerness that is very prevalent and is something that um, is actually not spoken about a lot because a lot of the time we focus on sexuality in terms of sexual attraction on its own. But for a lot of people, sexual attraction doesn't just happen on its own. It happens after, you know, becoming close to somebody. The other thing I really love about Lan Wanji and the way that love is expressed by his character in the show is the steadfast devotion that he shows towards Wei Wuxian. He is always respecting Wei Wuxian's boundaries, his wishes. Um, you know, even from the very beginning, when Wei Wuxian first followed Lan Wanji to help him on his quest, um, you know, Lan Wenji could have turned around and said, get lost. Like, this isn't your quest. This is my quest. You know, take a hike. But he didn't do that. He respected Wei Wuxian's decision to come with him, and he let him tag along. And we see that being born through some of these really heart-wrenching scenes, like, oh my god, the scene in the rain when Lan Wenji is standing there with the umbrella, and Wei Wuxian is on the horse, and he's taking these when clan members to protect them, to bring them to the burial grounds. You can see this moment where um, Lan Wenqi really wants to stop him. And in fact, he has been told by other people to go and stop him. Um, but he respects Wei Wuxian's decision uh, to go and to protect these people because what he loves about Wei Wuxian is his soul and his spirit and his ethos. And if he didn't respect Wei Wuxian's wishes, he would be disrespecting the thing that he loves about that guy. So I thought that was such a soul-wrenching moment, but also such a display of the way in which Lan Wenji loves him. He loves him as a human being, and he respects him and his wishes. And that was just like, wow, like, wow. Even later on, when he goes to visit Wei Wuxian in the burial grounds, you can see how much he misses him and how much he wants to be there. You know, and they're eating in this cafe in the village and the, the two of them with Ayuan, and you're like, this is your glimpse into what their life could be like if they were together. These two beautiful human beings raising this child together, this is what it would look like. And it's such a beautiful glimpse. And then, you know, they get back to the burial grounds and it becomes clear that Wei Wuxian is not ready to leave this place and Long Wenji is not yet ready to leave his family either. He feels a lot of responsibility towards being a member of the Lan Clan. And so you can see these two people kind of like on the cusp of wanting to have some kind of relationship together, but neither of them being ready. And that is, again, a time in which Lan Wanji demonstrates his respect for his partner in saying, you know, I'm going to respect the fact that you're doing this. This is your choice. This is where you want to be. There is a part of me that kind of wishes that Lan Wanji had just told him he loved him just one time before everything that happened next, because maybe if he had told him that he loved him, Wei Wuxian might not have died because he might not have, I think he lost hope, you know, after his sister passed away. And so if he knew that Lan Wenji loved him, that he wasn't alone, I think that that might have saved his life. But I don't think Lan Wenji was ready to say that yet. And um, obviously the moment that Wei Wuxian fell off the cliff, that look of horror in Lan Wenji's eyes, oh my God. Um, Oh, such a such a powerful moment because you can see that he just it's like he's seeing his life fall off the cliff and only at that moment at which his entire life is gone he just steps back and he's like I don't even know like what to do like there's just this moment of sort of hopelessness 
So I kind of wish that he had said that he loved him, but of course then it wouldn't be the same show. <laughs> but like, you can write fan fiction about what that would look like, or I could, I could look at what the, I could write fan fiction about them, what that would look like. If I had time, I have so many fan fictions on the go right now. Uh, so that whole, um, you know, that way that Lam Wen Chi respected him is what kind of tore me apart inside because you could see that, um, you know, there was just so much love between those those guys. There was just so much love. I also want to talk about the portrayal of family in The Untamed. We've talked a lot already about the individual journeys of Wei Wuxian and Lang Wenji, but The Untamed itself also covered a lot of core themes about family. Um, and I think that those core themes are really important as a queer person. So we talked about how the Wei Wuxian being an orphan kind of affected his worldview and also how that's kind of representative of what a queer kid's experience is and their worldview. But I think that we also have important examples to look at in the Lan family. And so first of all, one of the things that I absolutely love, like one of my favorite things about The Untamed, is how Lan Shi Chen is Lan Wanji's wingman how he is always like cheering him on and you know from the get-go he could see that Lan Wanji was sort of like half annoyed and half infatuated with Wei Wuxian and he basically like shoves him forward and says you should become friends with that guy um <laughs> and so he like encourages Lan Wanji from the get-go and I just think that is so great like I just love the twin jades you know the, the way that Lan Wenji doesn't have to say anything, and Lan Shi Chen sort of reads him very well. Um, it's just so great. Like, having a supportive family member that's your wingman is so important, and especially for somebody that is queer, like, you need to have at least one solid rock in your life that you know is going to love you, like, no matter what you do. Um, and I think people who don't have that are ones that are more likely to, um, you know, experience things like depression and what actually happened to Wei Wuxian. Um, but I think one of the reasons why Lan Wenji was okay and why he survived and why he, you know, made it through that time is because he had a brother that accepted him and loved him no matter what. So I just really, really, really love Lan Shi Chen. And uh, Liu Haikuan, who acted that role, did a fantastic, fantastic job. In the Lan family, we also don't have his parents in the picture because they've passed away uh, when he was younger, but we do have the uncle, and I, I call him the disapproving uncle, uh, and I think that every person has somebody in their family that is the disapproving uncle. <laughs> so I kind of love the fact that Lan Chiren was this disapproving uncle character um, because it represents that, you know, and... In the show, Lan Chiren was, uh, sorry, I'm butchering his name, um, was really disapproving of Wei Wuxian uh, because of the demonic cultivation, you know, and when you think of it also as an allegory for queerness, then, you know, it's it falls through that Lan Chiren is disapproving of the taint of queerness that Wei Wuxian is inflicting upon the perfect Long Wanji. So, you know, before Wei Wuxian came along, nobody even knew that Lan Wenji was queer, except maybe his brother. And then Lan Wenji pops into the picture, and all of a sudden, you know, everyone knows that Lan Wenji is queer because everyone can see on his face, like, even though he has a very stoic face, everyone can see that he's just, like, captivated by him. Um, so I think a lot of what was tangled up in that disapproval from the uncle was a disapproval of you know, everything that Wei Wuxian represented. He represented chaos. He represented sexual liberation. You know, he he represented everything that the lands were against in terms of, like, you've got to be restricted and act properly and um, be good <laughs> and all of that. And even the other thing is in the Lang clan, of course, they had a separation of genders as well. Men and women were housed in different places and stuff. And so... Uh, I imagine there was probably quite a bit of queer stuff happening just from the fact that they separated the sexes so much, but on the other hand, a disapproval of anything that was in any way sexual, right? 
like the reason that they separated the genders is so that they wouldn't get up to hanky panky, I'm sure. So the idea of like, especially like at the end of, of the novel or at the post the end of the show, if you can imagine these two like living together in cloud recesses, um, you know, da -na 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 -na. The, the idea of that with this disapproving uncle in the background just makes me crack up laughing. Like it's so awesome. But it also kind of reminds me of that, you know, a lot of people in the families that when you come out as queer and you say, this is my partner, a lot of people are like, um, we just don't want you to love that person. Just find somebody else. Right. And so this, that is kind of how I think that Lan Chidan sort of like, um, viewed Wei Wuxian, like just find somebody else, anybody else. Like I think if, if you had found anybody else, the uncle would have been happier. Next, I want to talk about gay adoption. Um, so I think this is a very important subject to talk about specifically in relation to China. Um, and I did a whole video about this that I'll put a link for in the, in the description. But in China today, in a nutshell, it's really not possible for a gay couple to have a child because first of all, gay adoption is illegal. And then secondly, surrogacy is illegal. So, um, you know, basically the only way that somebody who's queer can have a child is if they um, decide to get married to somebody for the purposes of having a kid and, and they pop a kid out and then, you know, divorce happens or whatever. Like, it's not a very easy uh, place for a gay couple to have a child. They can ri take a risk. Um, you know, people in China could take a risk of coming abroad and doing surrogacy abroad and trying to bring the child back home. But, you know, you can you can take some sort of risks legally doing things that way as well. So it's definitely not cut and dry easy to do that. So because of the restrictions against gay adoption in modern China, I think it's really interesting that they portrayed a story of gay adoption in ancient China, in fictional ancient China. Um, so, you know, you, we first see this adoption story starting when Ayuan becomes orphaned in this war where the Wens get taken out of power. And then when Wei Wuxian brings the Wens over to the burial grounds, he adopts this kid, basically. You know, there is this grandmother figure that's also taking care of Ayuan. But we can see a really close relationship developing between Wei Wuxian and Ayuan. And I think everybody would agree that that is sort of like a parent-child relationship that forms between the two of them. And they're not actually together for a super long period of time in the storyline because they're really only together during that, um, you know, the, those those months when they're in the burial grounds together. Um, or is it years that they're in the burial grounds together? I can't remember how long in the story timeline they're actually in the burial grounds. But basically that experience of the two of them in the burial grounds is when that relationship develops. And then after um, the attack on the burial mounds and after Wei Wuxian uh, effectively commits suicide, um, you know, the Ayuan is now orphaned again. And this is the moment at which Lan Wenji goes back to the burial mounds and he finds Ayuan there. Now he has a decision to make here about what to do with this child. And I have seen a lot of debates about this online on Tumblr and stuff like that about what were Lan Wenji's motivations when he decided to take this child. And some people think that it's a little bit um, insincere, his motivations. But in my mind, there's really one of two different reasons why he might have taken Ayuan um, in the first place. One reason would be because as a Lan, you know, you're somebody that is taught to help other people. And of course, like, he wouldn't just leave Ayuan there. So he's going to try and protect him and save his life. The other reason could have been that Ayuan was the last, you know, real connection between himself and the person he was in love with, right? So um, knowing that Ayuan was basically Wei Wuxian's child, now Ayuan becomes the only thing that Wei Wuxian has left behind in this world. And out of respect for Wei Wuxian and out of love for him, he would want to take care of his child. Uh, I think that is a noble intention. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with that as an intention. And it doesn't even really matter because regardless of his initial motivations in bringing this child back to the cloud recesses, once he was there, 
we see this, um, you know, of course time passes and we skip forward, but we see the results of many, many, many years of parenting there, right? We know that um, Shi Tsui, as he becomes called later in life, uh, has been raised by the Lang clan, but we can clearly see a father-son relationship between him and Lang Wanji. And we can see that it's a totally different type of father-son relationship than the one that he had with Wei Wuxian, right? Uh, and that's natural because they're two completely different people. So there's definitely more of an authoritative, you know, when uh, Lang Wanji asks Shi Tsui to actually do something, then he does it immediately without question. So we can see that there's a little bit of, um, you know, an authoritative relationship there. But we can also see that there is an incredible amount of love and we can see Lama Ji being very tender towards him in a way that he isn't with most of the other people in the clan. Um, so there's clearly a lot of respect and a lot of love in that relationship. And Lama Ji has done a good job raising this kid. I mean, if you can imagine if you were orphaned, if your parents were killed, if your entire clan was killed, you'd probably turn out pretty messed up. Um, and the fact that he turned out so well behaved, so, um, you know, full of self-respect as well is a testament to how Lan Wenji must have raised this kid. He must have taught him as a youngster that, you know, that he's worth, um, being a good person and that, uh, the things that happened to him in his youth don't mean that he has to grow up to be a horrible person, that he can grow up to be a part of the Lan clan just like everybody else. So he created this nurturing environment for him. And I think that's really, really important. Then at the end of the show, we see Wei Wuxian and Lan Wenji reunited and um, Shi Tsui or A Yuan is together with them. And we see another glimpse into what they would have looked like as a family. And there's a part of me that goes like, oh, like I wish Wei Wuxian had been there for all of those years and that he had participated in the raising of A Yuan because I think even though he turned out really great as a kid, like I think he would have benefited from having Wei Wuxian's chaotic influence in his life so that it wasn't always this rigid, strict, Lan clan sort of like, you know, morals that there would have been room for a little bit more creative expression. Um, so I think it's kind of sad that he didn't get to have Wei Wuxian in his life when he was younger, but then you also get to see this glimpse forward at what their life might look like after the end of the show, you know, the two of them together with the kid. And I think that's, you know, it's really, really nice, really nice moment. And I also think it's important that this show displayed this relationship because I have heard some reports of, you know, translations of things that people have posted on Weibo that some people who didn't know very many gay people and had never seen, um, you know, a BL show before, watch The Untamed, and that they saw that, you know, queer relationships are not just about sex, that they're about love and devotion and can include children and stuff like that. And I think, you know, displaying these themes in a show in a country where there isn't a lot of that already is really important for slowly turning the dial in terms of people seeing queer people not just as tokens, but as real human beings. Um, so, you know, if even a few people had their minds changed about whether gay people should adopt in China because of this show, that's helping, <laughs> you know, every little bit helps. So I'm definitely really happy that they displayed this relationship in the show. So the last major theme I want to um, talk about is intimacy. So um, I actually spoke with some other queer folks about, you know, why was the untamed meaningful to them? Because I think a lot of the time, you know, the majority of the fandom is straight. Um, and so it's sort of hard to find the queer voices in there sometimes. And so when I found a group of queer people, I was like, hey, you know, what is it that you really like about The Untamed? And something that kept coming back again and again from different people was they really enjoyed the fact that the relationship was not hypersexualized. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, Obviously, I think all of us know that there is censorship in China, and I am not here to say that I approve of censorship in any way. That is not what this is. Um, you know, I think it is really sad that they can't just have the freedom to create shows exactly the way that they want to. But we know that because of censorship, 
that they're limited in the amount of physical contact that can be shown between the two men and they are not overtly allowed to declare that they love each other and there's various other you know censorship rules that would come in place um so after a tv show is made it goes through a censorship review and then sometimes they'll say you have to cut some stuff out and and then we get the final product that we get so we know that censorship played a role here but if you look at the other side of the coin and you look at how queer representation on television in other countries is done, uh, you can see it's not always a good thing to have too much sex in a TV show. So for example, if we take a look at some of the BL works that are created in Thailand or in Japan, um, you know, there are sometimes some really questionable themes or tropes that we see being repeated over and over again. And a lot of those tropes don't actually pan out in real world relationships for queer, that queer people experience. And so there are tropes that are repeated over and over again that um, sometimes disseminate stereotypes that are actually not realistic in terms of the actual motivations and behaviors of people within the queer community. And so those sorts of things can be harmful. For example, you know, I think a lot of straight people have these very rigid ideas about how sex happens between two men and, you know, that there's always a top and there's always a bottom and, you know, that sex is really important and that gay men have sex all the time and, I don't know, like, there's, uh, they might be uh, thinking that queer people have sex with a lot more partners than straight people do. Like, I think that there are a lot of stereotypes that can crop up um, that are unfortunately sometimes reinforced by things that people see on television. So I think that a lot of queer people get a little bit cringy when we see some BL. Um, and it's not to say that there aren't good ones, because obviously The Untamed is a good one. And there are others that I like a lot that I have done videos on before and I will continue to do videos about BL in the future. There are some amazing BLs. I'm particularly impressed with the BLs coming out of Korea, I have to admit. I've been a huge fan of Korean dramas for a long, long time, but they've only just started doing BLs recently and I'm really, really impressed with the high quality and with the respectful nature of the relationships that I've seen, you know, depicted thus far. So unfortunately, though, there are some others where they display things like dubious lack of consent. Like there have definitely been times where I have watched a BL TV series or sometimes even read a comic or, you know, read a BL novel and went, oh, my God, I love this until we come across some rape scene. And then I'm like, why did they have to put that in there? <laughs> like, the whole thing was great. And then you threw this gratuitous rape scene in there that made me like, not able to continue consuming this media. So um, not that I don't think that you should ever have a rape scene in something. Like I think when it is meaningful towards the, the story um, and it's a real part of the thing, but when it's just like two people that supposedly love each other having sex and oops, there's like a non-consensual, you know, thing that happens there. That's like, that's gratuitous. That's not, that's not needed. That probably results in a lot of queer people having the cringe for BL. Um, and ironically, if you look at the novel that The Untamed was based off of, there are some of those cringy, kind of not totally consensual moments in that novel. Um, so if they didn't have censorship and if they did include some of those cringy, non totally consensual moments, I probably would not have liked the TV show as much. I'm just going to be honest about that. That is not to say that I don't like the novel and there, I am in no way trying to criticize the author here. I think MXTX wrote an amazing novel and the last thing that I want to do is criticize the author. Um, but I do think that I personally preferred the TV show to the novel for that reason. I think one of the reasons that The Untamed was so magical is that it didn't have too many sexual elements in it. And so instead, the story became about love. And oh God, the love in this show. The moments of intimacy between these two. 
the way that they would look in each other's eyes and they would know what the other was thinking without even having to say any words. The way that they would casually touch each other on the hand. The tender way that Wei Wuxian cleaned off Lama Ji's cheek when he was drunk. The way that they look at each other. Oh my God, this moment right here made my heart explode into a million tiny pieces and I will never, ever recover from this. These moments, these were so, so, so much more important than sex. Do I wish that they had kissed just once in the show? Absolutely yes. But if I had a choice between full-on sex scenes and what they made, I would pick what they made. I would pick what they made. It was beautiful and intimate and really showed the relationship that was about partnership, intimacy, and love. And it was really beautiful. So aside from all of the queer elements that we have mentioned thus far, I do have two other small things that I want to talk about. The first one is the cinematography. Um, I cannot talk about this show without talking about how beautiful and, you know, just a knockout show this was. The cinematography was beautiful. The sets that they built, the clothing and the costumes that they wore, the props, the hair, the makeup, all of it was just perfect. The one thing visually that I didn't like was the special effects, but I worked in the special effects industry, so I probably have a more critical eye than some other people do. And I do know that they did not have a very high budget for this show, and so I know that they did the best with what they had. Um, so that's not a criticism, but to say that this show was stunningly beautiful would not be an understatement at all. This show was stunningly beautiful, even in spite of the sometimes awful special effects. <laughs> Finally, I want to talk about Wang Yibo and Xiao Shan. Um, I know this has been a really long video. I don't even want to think about how long this is still going to be after I cut it, but I need to talk for a few minutes about how beautiful and incredible these two human beings are. Um, I do not think that this show would have been the same at all if they had cast different people in these roles. Xiao Chan absolutely embodied Wei Wuxian. His youthful exuberance, his strength of character, his determination, and also his passion. I have watched almost everything Xiao Chan has done. I haven't watched Superstar Academy, but it's because I can't. And in spite of watching almost everything that Xiao Chan has done, I still think to date this is his best role. I have not seen him do anything better than this role. And I think one of the reasons that he did so, so, so well in this role is that, um, you know, he really related to this character. And when he was being interviewed afterwards, he talked about how much this character spoke to him and how much it touched him and how he had a hard time separating himself from the role after filming was finished. I think that, you know, he really had a relationship with this role. And even recently when he was talking about all of his roles that he did in the past, he referred to Wei Wuxian as Ashian. You know, he refers to him in such a loving way, like the two of them are friends. I just think that's so incredible. And then also there's Wang Yibo cast as Lan Wenji. I think they made an absolutely perfect decision to cast Wang Yibo as Lan Wenji. And I do not think anyone else would have been able to do this role. Um, not only was it incredibly difficult because of the martial arts, and when it does come to the martial arts, we know that they deliberately cast dancers to do um, heavy martial arts roles because especially with this style of martial arts, which is very flowy and fairy like, you know, being a dancer can really help you to pick up the moves a lot um, more quickly. And Wang Yibo absolutely picked up the moves. You know, he was filming all kinds of other stuff at the same time as he was filming The Untamed. And, you know, he was able to come in, slip into that role and just embody Lan Wang Ji. 
And I find it absolutely shocking that he was only 20 years old when he filmed this role. You know, particularly when you look at the older Lam Wanji, the poise, uh, you know, the 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 subtle looks in his eyes that he would get sometimes when he's acting this role, I would not have thought that a 20-year-old person would have been capable to embody this character. But he did, and he was perfect. And it's so funny sometimes when you watch, like, the BTS footage and you see that Ebo in real life is this gremlin who's, like, totally chaotic and full of energy and, you know, having fun all over the place. And then... Boom, he slides into Lamanji and he becomes this, like, you know, stoic character. And, um, of course, he is a more reserved person. He doesn't talk a lot, except when he's around his friends. Um, so he is a more reserved person. And that, I think, was the side of him that they saw when they did the casting. Uh, but he just, he brought magic to this role. Absolute magic. And I've also seen everything that Wang Yibo has done. And... He has some other stuff that he's done that I've really, really, really liked. Uh, but I still, you know, Lamoji is the character that made me fall in love with Wang Yibo, And I will never forget that. Obviously, I love him since he's on my wall. So um, speaking of the official BTS videos um, that were released by Tencent, like I, you know, when I first watched those back in 2019, um, I saw this incredible connection between the two actors. They just looked like they had so much fun together. You know, like you could see them always playing around behind the scenes and, you know, it just really showed uh, a connection and happiness to be around each other that really made the show even more special for me because knowing that the actors had a good time making the show, um, it's sort of that, I think that's part of what shone through in the characters. So I also don't think it would have been the same if they didn't have that sort of friendship to, to draw upon. So I really look forward to seeing what Wang Yibo and Xiao Chan do next. Um, from Xiao Chan, we have Oath of Love coming up soon, which I'm looking forward to watching. And then I'm dying to see Wang Yibo as being a hero. So please release these shows so we can watch them. So in summary, I think The Untamed was a show that captured a lot of people's attention uh, and their hearts and their love. I think that this show is particularly meaningful to queer people because... Um, you know, we see a, a representation of ourselves on the screen that I think a lot of us can relate to and can look up to. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And like me, I hope you'll do a rewatch of The Untamed this summer because for me, at least, this show will never be over. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone, for watching. And I'll see you soon. Bye. And here we have Tiny Cat joining the video. What do you think, Tiny? What do you think about The Untamed? Do you like the fact that I have my Wang Yibo and Xiao Chan dolls on the bookshelf? Hmm? Look how cute she is. I'm very mad at me. Okay, I'm going to... Oh, but I want to put you on the desk. I can't hold you right now. She wants me to hold her. She likes to be cuddled like a baby. This is Tiny Cat. Okay? Okay, you go. Oh, no, you can't go on my lap. Okay, fine. You go on my lap, but you have to settle down. I need you to settle down. Come on. She needs a circle, circle. Okay, settle down. I have to do this video. Only got a few minutes. Okay, let me see if I can get her to.